Herzlich willkommen zum KS Podcast aus dem Kindle Athletic System Gym in München. Herzlich willkommen, mein Name ist Sebastian Keintel, hier ist der KS Podcast für euch und es gibt nach einer kleinen Pause eine neue Folge und wir haben etwas ganz Besonderes für euch und zwar den ersten internationalen Gast. Das bedeutet auch, ihr hört mich heute etwas äh, Englisch sprechen, denn Rolf Ohmann, unser Gast, der sich bereit erklärt hat, mir alle Fragen zu beantworten, die ich ihm stelle und es war ein ganzer Haufen. Rolf Ohmann ist äh, momentan für die, das chinesische Olympische Komitee zuständig. Er trainiert dort mit Randy Huntington, unter anderem auch äh, der Trainer des äh, momentan schnellsten Manns auf 60 Metern, Su Bing Tian. Ähm, er trainiert dort mit ihm die Sprinter und äh, Springer. Und er ist ein Experte auf dem Gebiet der Schnelligkeitsentwicklung und auch Explosivkraft. Er ist unter anderem auch Erfinder des 1080 Sprints. Kennen sicherlich viele aus der Szene. Ähm, ein super interessanter Mann, ähm, sehr offen. Ich äh, war ganz angetan, habe viel zugehört. Wie ihr sehen werdet, äh, hatten wir am Anfang ein paar technische Probleme, auch mit dem Ton. Ähm, das wird im Laufe des äh, Podcasts besser. Es war ein... Äh, ein etwas technisch rauer Einstieg, aber äh, Rolf Ohmann war super geduldig und an dieser Stelle nochmal vielen Dank. Wir werden zwei Folgen aus dem ersten Interview machen, denn es waren äh, zweieinhalb Stunden, die ich äh, Rolf äh, Ohmann Fragen gestellt habe für euch und äh, dementsprechend machen wir zwei Folgen drauf. Jetzt kommt die erste Folge. Wir werden uns über Long-Term Athletic Development äh, unterhalten, die Entwicklung von Schnelligkeit vor der Pubertät, ähm, verschiedene Typen an Coaches, die richtigen Metriken, also sehr, sehr viele Informationen, hört gut zu und ich wünsche euch viel Spaß, in diesem Sinne, genießt die Folge. Yeah, yeah. so far away. So, uh, first, uh, thanks for your time, <lacht> now, now even more appreciated. <lacht> Not a problem, not a problem. Uh, just, um, yeah, you got me very interested in uh, a couple of things because um, like um, I first listened to the Simply Faster podcast you did and then um, searched for like everything I could find and I... Uh, uh saw that you did uh, like a uh, four episodes with um mike and booker yeah and, yeah, they, um, they yeah and then i also uh found your um your presentation on uh long-term development um for the shanghai um conference i guess it was yeah which um, is Yeah, that was that that long-term athletic development was actually a project that I've been doing with uh, Professor Rick Howard um, from Western University for Sri Lanka. Um, but unfortunately, the, the the whole economy of Sri Lanka has just totally crashed because of COVID, um, and uh, it's just the, the country is just run by corrupt politicians. So the whole project and everything that was supposed to start um, with a project called um, Gold March um, has fallen, fallen apart. There is no funding, there is nothing. Um, and we probably did about a year of work, um, Rick and myself and a few other guys, uh, restructuring the whole, the whole sporting from, from virtually the basic Uh, eight 12 year olds all the way up to to um, Olympic sports and, okay uh, yeah so part of that presentation at Shanghai was for uh, for Sasha uh, to do because of the the severe lockdowns with uh, Shanghai okay mm. yeah uh, um, because uh, one thing that also uh, struck my mind when you said it on um, uh, one of the podcasts was um, that 
basically the speed in which um, the limbs can be move uh, can be moved is uh, set uh, um, up until pu puberty and cannot uh, be developed later on, and uh, that's something that I learned too in, um, in my uh, studies. But um, I've actually never found any uh, like scientific evidence for it. I, I I've like no. it was presented to me in the university and um, like you read it all over, but I never found anything about that. No, it's it's one of these gray areas where um, there is, like, just like you, you just said, that there is virtually no research done about it. But at the same time, there are quite a few papers that, that stipulate that um, that movement and limb speed is is set by, you know, by puberty. Um, I think Randy and I uh, we have we have our own sort of um, conclusion to that, and I think the problem is that a lot of the training is just simply too stereotyped, um, and therefore you what happens is that you cap you cap the uh, the ability um, to re, uh, to reposition fast. And that is, and, and I think the problem is that most people are speed at the right way. Um, speed, you can have, a, you, for example, we have guys that have got absolutely, we've, we've had them tested in, in labs so that we know they have incredible um, genetic uh, disposition to running fast. So they have, you know, uh, their fast twitch fiber uh, composition is just crazy, yet they they, they struggle to run faster than 1050. Now, the question is, why is that? Because everybody's just been looking at, at the fact that, okay, if you've got a high uh, ratio of fast switch fibers, you can run fast. Yeah. Yes, but you've got to be able to reposition. Now, yeah. repositioning is totally dependent on elasticity. So what happens is that in younger years, there is no development of elasticity. So the, the actual cap itself is not the fact that you haven't been doing the right type of things, well, training-wise, but you've done no elasticity. That, that is the problem. And that's, that's why a lot of, for example, if you look at the Asians, the agents don't have that problem because they do a shitload of what we call very good unnecessary training, which is mostly elasticity. So they're extremely elastic, but they've got there's a whole bunch of other things that is completely missing. So it's it's actually easier um, to get agents to run fairly quickly if you're allowed to if you're allowed to be left alone and do what you need to do. But there are too many other influences. That, you know, people upstairs who think they know what they're talking about, who've got no idea about high performance, um, and all of a sudden they'll, they'll come down and say, oh, we need to do this and we need to do this and fitness. I mean, like, I think it was like two years ago or three years ago, all of a sudden one day that some guy from upstairs comes down and says to Randy, me, oh, the, your sprinters aren't fit enough. What do you mean not fit enough? Oh, we've decided that they have to do fitness tests. Okay, we do fitness tests all the time. Look, we've got like... We have a whole spreadsheet. Yeah. If this is what this is what matters. These are the you know the, the key performance indicators, according to us. And we've been doing this for the last 35, 40 years. Um, so what what have you got in mind? Oh, we need to do a sit and reach test. We need to do a uh, Cooper test, and we need to do a um, a chins test. And Randy and I just stood there, you know, sort of. Are you kidding? You, you want sprinters to run 3,000 metres? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're not fit enough. And so you've got a lot of these sort of things in, in a lot of these countries where some of us, unfortunately, well, fortunately, um, work, is that there are these ideas that have got no substance and there is no research, there is, there's nothing. It's just that people just don't... The, the biggest problem in Asia is... And, and for that matter, I, I, I have a, uh, a kid in Australia that is he's the number three sprinter in Australia. And we have the same. That's why I, I live in Europe. Um, and that is because we don't understand a process in Australia in track and field. There is, there is no process. There is sort of like 
you know, oh, we'll do this, we'll do that, because that, that person over there has run fast or jumped far or, or thrown far, so let's, let's just copy their training. And so everybody copies. But nobody understands actually the process and, you know, what is, what is actually going on um, as far as what, what is speed, what is power development, how do these go together, what is long-term athletic development. There's no, there is no plan because there's no model. Yeah. No model. But um, yeah. that's the biggest problem. Um, like one one thing uh, um, that I think about quite a lot is uh, like you read about long term athletic development. You hear like every uh, high performance coach talk about the importance of it. Uh, and over the years, I do get more of the impression that it is something that most of the coaches and even uh, or scientists also um, know that would be important but it's just due to uh, like the politics and the structural uh, setups almost never um, something you um, you accomplish because like in in most of the like in the team sports the problem is the early specialization due to like uh, making money of of youth clubs and uh, trying to um, get them to sort out the talents early and stuff like this. And you, you have like a s s minimal uh, amount of athletes who come out in high performance sports like uh, Dirk Nowitzki or uh, Ro Roger Federer in tennis that are like uh, late special, uh, specialized uh, athletes. So yeah. it, do you think that it's, it's like uh, something that still is uh, value uh, has value and should be aimed for to to in, incorporate this in all the uh, like olympic committees and stuff but is uh, at at the same time is something that you almost never um, are able to work with like uh, really developed athletes uh, yeah, it's a good question. I I, I actually had a, a long discussion with a colleague in Australia and one of the one of the very good coaches we have in Australia who, who works in his own professional setup. Um, and we were talking about this because what, what, what you have today is you have, you have sort of a, 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 a two, there's virtually two channels how, how coaches come into the sport and, and what, sort of, what sort of information, what sort of knowledge do they have. So you have one, you have the academic guys who have gone, who've done Uh, different degrees in in, in uh, sports science and in so forth, um, and that's all good. I mean, there's no there's no doubt that education. Is great. But now comes the big but. Most of the research that is done uh, on uh, different types of training protocols is done on college students. Yeah. There is not there's not one single one of these research papers that has been done on, a, let's say, for example, um, a 983 sprinter, which I've worked with and Randy had in, in China. There's, yep. there's, there's nothing. So you have all these wonderful papers that, that say this, 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 and this, and this, and that. Yeah, great. But they're all done on people who have very limited background, very limited, um, to be quite honest, talent many, many times. So how do I, how do I sort of gauge that um, yeah. and most of these researchers are exactly that they're researchers they don't work in in practical track and field yeah um, so there is there is this thinking in a lot of places that the researchers are the guys who are the guys who are at the forefront they're, they're developing the sport they're sort of lifting the bar no no uh, I don't want to beat on my drum, but it wasn't a researcher that developed the 1080 sprint system. It was me yeah. and I was a coach. Um, and why did I develop that? Because the, the quantum system, which is the, the first system, um, it was built because I and Randy and I have been colleagues for many years and I was given an opportunity in Sweden by a university to do a, a health robotics project. So the... That where I live in Sweden, mm -hmm. one of the biggest was used to be the, the headquarters of ABB Robotics, which is the, the world leader in, in industrial robotics. So all of a sudden in early 2003, 2004, 
one of the people who are uh, one of the highest um, uh, administrators of ABB said to the, the, the university, um, which is a very large university in the town, we, we'd like to see if, if, if there is an application for health robotics using our technology. And they had no idea you know, what, you know, what, what does that mean? Where, where do we go? What do we do? And as it was, I had a high-performance gym where I was mm -hmm. predominantly working with hockey, which is what I've worked with in many years in Sweden, apart from a few athletes that I coached. Uh, I had a 580 pole vaulter in Sweden, for example, the first 580 pole vaulter in Sweden. Um, so they came to me because, as it happened, one of the ABB directors, his wife actually trained it at my gym. Yeah. She told the husband, well, look, the guy that we're, who owns the gym where I train, he seems to know what he's talking about. Um, so they came down, had a meeting with me, and the rest is history. Now, why did I want to build the quantum? Well, because we, we, had, we had already a project in Sweden a few years or 15 years earlier. It was called Breakman. It was a device that lowered very slowly, extremely heavy weights eccentrically. Mm -hmm. It was predominantly used on professional ice hockey players, and there's some very, very good papers that have come out of that project. And it, it showed clearly that, you know, um, super maximum loading in the eccentric phase produced extremely strong force production athletes. Um, it didn't do anything as far as power um, because power has is one component missing, and that's velocity. Yeah. So Randy and I <clears throat> met uh, many, many years ago on, on a conference, so we've sort of kept in contact, and then when I started the project and, and told Randy, this is what I want to do, um, because Randy has a, a theory that he's been plugging, well, not to everybody, but a few selected people, and he calls it DIS, Dynamic yep. Isometric Strength. And that is that, in, in our view, there is no lengthening in the, in the eccentric phase. There is actually, an, it's an isometric, especially in the last few degrees of, for example, a, a squat. Those last few degrees, there is no more lengthening. Um, and there is two ways of this DIS to, to, to happen, and that is either by very, very heavy loading or high velocity, or, or both. Yeah. If, if you start in one end and then you, you add the other. So you, you first build capacity and then you build speed. So what we very, very, very clearly saw that is that when we started then um, using and testing, we could see that we had athletes who were producing massive, you know, uh, counter movement jumps and so forth. Um, and that was sort of the, the benchmark. Everybody was saying, you know, counter movement jumps, that's the king of all metrics and power. Ah, uh, no, it's not. Because we found very, very quickly, we saw that we had athletes who were jumping, let's say, 60 centimetres or 55 centimetres in the vertical jump in the CMG. Um, and you had guys who were jumping 80, 85, 90 centimetres, which is a huge, huge jump. Yeah. Yet, when you looked at the peak velocity of both of these, they were virtually the same. Now, how, how is that possible? If this guy can only jump 50 centimetres and this guy jumps nearly the double, I mean, his velocity should be much, much higher. So we dug down deeper, and then we looked at acceleration, and now all of a sudden Pandora's box opened because as soon as we started looking at, at, at acceleration in the first 50, 100, 150 milliseconds, we could see that the guy who was jumping 55 centimetres, his rate of force development was on an angle like this, and the other guy was like that. So... so uh, just one question, because that's something I uh, didn't uh, get uh, um, clearly. Is it like when you talk about the um, the first 50 milliseconds, is it uh, f from the start of like the uh, concentric movement, like the, the propulsion phase of a counter movement jump, or is it uh, when the eccentric part hits uh, like the deceleration? Because... Well, you've got yeah, well, you've got, you've got two phases. So you've got the eccentric RFD. So in other words, how how fast yeah. Yeah. you accelerate? That's the, that's the number. That's that's probably 
the the key component because we know that well at least Randy and I and Rainer and a few other guys we we have this idea that you can't get anything more in the concentric phase than that you can handle eccentrically. Mm-hmm. There is, of course, a little bit of give, give and take in that because you've got structures such as fascias and, and bone and bone density and a few other things, and all of those things add up to elasticity, and then you've got your, your, your muscle elasticity or stretch shortening cycle. So those things, of course, add up to that, but, but basically whatever you can handle and this is what you build. You center rate of force of development by adding velocity. And then you add, vo- add weight. You add velocity. You add weight. You add velocity. You add weight. So you progress this way the whole time. And that way you will build the concentric phase acceleration. And the quicker you can get out of the stop position back concentrically, and this is what we've seen, for example, when we look at, at Su, Su Bing Chan. Now, he's the fastest man uh, in Asia, but he's also en route to his 983 in, in Tokyo. He ran a 627, yeah. 60 metres. Yeah. His acceleration capacity is just absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, now, he's, he's a small guy. He, he has a fairly small step. So he, he has certain limitations. So what Randy decided very early on was that if we're going to get this guy to run real fast and we think he can run under 980, we still do, and we're getting pretty close, um, we need to be able to accelerate better than everybody else, and he does that. Now, he does that because of two factors. Number one, his eccentric rate of force development and his acceleration or his DIS is is insane. It, it is truly remarkable what this guy can do. For example, uh, in a Kaiser squat with two hundred kilos at a weight of seventy one, seventy two yeah, kilos, sort of. it's 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 ridiculous. You know, he's 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 using three times his body weight, and it's like boom, 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 boom. There's no stop. There's just it's just a a complete different thing. Now, if you look at when Randy started coaching um, Sue back in 2015, that wasn't the case. It, it was a very sort of <clears throat> <clears throat> because there was no there was no elasticity, there was no um, acceleration um, either in the eccentric phase because there was no capacity, and yeah. there was no capacity coming back into the concentric phase. So what we found is that the most important factor is acceleration it's not it's not peak velocity peak velocity is great and that's why we've been doing a lot of work with kaiser and kaiser are coming out with a, a whole line of new um equipment and, and oh well uh, software because we we've shown them and and you know we've had a lot of meetings with them and randy's worked with kaiser for many years yeah no so we have a very good understanding with kaiser but the fact that <sighs> Peak velocity and power isn't the, you know, the, the the king of metrics because you can get guys, for example, which we've shown on numerous occasions. We've got guys who have come in and they've they've tested it and let's say they they produce two thousand watts and then they they do a lot of interventions and we retest them six, eight, nine, ten weeks later and now they're doing two thousand five hundred, two thousand seven hundred watts and everybody's jumping around, high fiving and everything else, but. But here comes the big, the, the big but. When we look at a couple of the figures, and one of the figures that I use, and that's why I use Muscle Lab, is TPV, time to peak yeah. velocity. That is an acceleration index. Now, what we can then see is that they're now producing 2,700 watts, which is 30% virtually more than previously. What has happened with TPV? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing. So in other words... They're producing more force, but at the same time. Now, yeah. if, you, if your event is okay with that, let's say if you've got a downhill skier who does um, yeah. long turn and you, you're pushing maybe 300, 400, 500 milliseconds. Now, I work with a guy, um, Robert, who's got four or five of the World, um, World Cup skiers in Slovenia, and we've talked greatly about this. Um, 
where they think that they need to build capacity over that period of time. Yes, you do. But you, it's also good to build it a little bit faster because it gives you more capacity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the whole thing is that it, it, it's all about repositioning, which is elasticity, and it's all about acceleration uh, from that point where the eccentric phase stops and you go back to the concentric and everyone that we've tested that does these remarkable results or the ones that are the better athletes, the thing that always sticks out is that their time to peak velocity and their acceleration capacity is better. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's what singles them out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, absolutely uh, logical because uh, you have certain time frames in your sports that allow you to produce, yeah. to effectively produce or transfer uh, the forces. And if you uh, cannot uh, produce the force in this time frame, then it's just worth nothing but being a capacity. No, and I mean, the, the notion that, you know, like, like the Americans use, um, a lot of the American colleges, for example, and a lot of sports in, in the US, but even in Europe, they use CMG testing to, to um, talent ID for sprinters, which is uh, it's crazy because a CMG, you, you're pushing, I've got a force plate, which I don't use very much anymore, uh, to be quite honest, because a lot of the figures that you get is, yeah, okay, but you, you're sort of, you're, 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 getting, you're getting figures that, that really you can't sort of relate to other things, and that, that's what it all boils down to. We've got to, Randy and I, we work a great deal about what we try to do is simplify. We, we, yeah. we, we try to dumb things down because at the end of the day, If you've got 300 variables to try to, you know, to fiddle around with, how, how in the hell are you going to know which one's doing which and what's 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 progressing, what's not progressing, and, and how do they tie into each other? So we're, we're trying to dumb everything down. Where, every, where unfortunately, and that's where the business is going a little bit wrong at the moment, We, you probably know because you're, you're German, so you know what VMAX Pro is. Yes. Yeah. We tried to talk to those guys. Mate, listen. We said, look, you need to put these metrics in. And they said, no. And I said, why? Well, nobody's asked for it. And I said to them, well, you know, there was a company, just a little small company these days. It's called Apple. And they went to market by the following. They said, people don't know what they're missing until they get an iPhone and with all the function. Now they understand how to, what they can do. Yeah. So I said... We're, we're looking at metrics, but nobody else is looking at metrics. No, that's because we're leading. We're, we're at the top of the, of, of the tree. So if you want to fiddle around with at the bottom of the tree, go ahead. So what they've got now is that they've got some sort of a, a rate of force development uh, or a TPV, which I, they call something. And the figure that you get is like 67,234. Now, how in the hell do I... What do I do with that? I mean, it doesn't doesn't make any sense. I mean, so the, the way, for example, that Randy and I look at, at strength training, uh, and this is what I when I did the, the last podcast, Randy did the first one, and then when Randy said to um, Joel uh, yep. at uh, Just Fly, um, look, the guy you want to talk to about this is Rolf, um, and. I try to explain to Joel, and I don't think it, it took Joel six weeks before sort of the, the marble started, you know, sort of falling down. Because what what we're saying is that, for example, we don't we don't use full squats all year yes. round. We don't use uh, uh, cleans from the floor all year round. Why? Yeah. Because they have a certain amount of time that we that it takes to, to do the exercise and to, to reach time to peak velocity. Yes. And we, we've found that the ground contact times that my event needs, for example, a sprinter like Sue, he's in the ground 85 milliseconds. So yes. for us, if we're going to get any transfer from what we're doing in the gym to the track, we have to have a gap that is not too big. Now, the bigger that gap is, and there's a colleague yes. in my Sweden that has it's got this fantastic word for this. He calls it gaposis. Yeah. I think it's just a fantastic word. There's no such word, but it's it's perfect because it it, it 
it explains exactly that if the gap between what you're doing in the gym and what is asked of you on the track is too great, there is no transfer. Yeah. It just, it just simply doesn't work. So the way we look at it is that we change exercises and we change the range of motion. Yeah. So that we, as we get closer and closer to the, the competition period, we do exercises, for example, cleans become hand cleans, they become drop hand cleans, they become drop uh, hand snatches because mm -hmm. each one is faster and faster. Yes. And the time to peak velocity decreases and we get down to time, so we're down to 100, 110 milliseconds. Now, that's pretty fast in the gym. Yes. But it's still it's still not 85 milliseconds, but it's getting closer. So yeah. the gap is is that instead of, you know, that. So we, yeah. we can transfer, and, and if anybody says that this doesn't work, well, we've got a guy called Su Bing Chun that, that um, definitely... Um, Shows how to... Yeah. Um, so, you know, like... I've got a sprinter now that I've been coaching because of COVID. I haven't been home for two years. Um, even though I live in Europe since many, many years, but Australia is still home. Uh, and I haven't been home for, for, for years because of COVID. So I've been, I've been coaching an Australian sprinter who's now run 10, 11, uh, with a little bit too much win, uh, and 10, 24. Now, two years ago, he did 10, 47. So we've been doing this um, and working with, with this philosophy Um and then the other thing is that to, to get this to work, you have to have a, a way of working. In other words, the, the, the periodization needs to change. So, and that's the other thing. If you listen to what I've talked to with Brooker and, and, yeah. and Mike, I work with what I call accumulation intensification periods. And I've learned that two week periods of accumulation, a, a, a recovery week, two weeks of intensification and a recovery week. So a, a block of, for example, maximum strength training or whatever you want to call that the block in my way of working is six weeks. Yeah. Um, so, um, who so many questions. Um, uh, like first, when you say um, a maximum uh, strength block, like how would, uh, uh, because it sounds like you have like a, uh, a set system of working from full range of motion to uh, a slightly lesser range of motion that is basically guided by developing the velocities and uh, time uh, time frames. Um, so for one, how is a, a maximum strength block different from, um, let's say, uh, explosive strength block or what, well, what kind of blocks would you would differentiate then? Well, I, I, I suppose if you're looking at um, at elite level now, when I, for example, started coaching Jacob, I mean he was running 10:47, so he was he was definitely fast. I mean you can't say that 10:47 is slow, but if you if you talk about world class sprinting, 10:47 is not fast at all. Yeah. Um, but um, he's now um, able to run over 12 meters per second at max velocity. His his weakness is still the acceleration phase. Uh, he's only just getting under 660 for the for the first 60 meters, but his his top end speed is actually considerably higher than what, for example, that Sue can run. Um, and that's one of the one of the, the ways that we also work is that you it, it's it unless to run real fast you've got to have high maximum velocity. So you we tend to look at developing those qualities and then we fix the the, the, the acceleration part. Um, as as we go along, so for example, with with Jacob, then when I started working with him and asked him, okay, what do you squat? And he says, oh, 140, 150. Okay, so show me. So, you know, we got on a Zoom call and he's doing, I think, a three or four or four rep squat. And I said, okay, now I want you to do a quarter squat, and I want you to add 40 kilos. So we're looking at sort of 180, and He's wobbling all over the place, and on it. There's, I mean, he's he's struggling, um, and 
I said to him, okay, now put a bit of speed on this. So we used a box, one of these soft boxes, so you mm-hmm. can you know, get a little bit of a bounce, which we do, because, we, you know, that does, it doesn't matter. There's People have all these ideas, and it's got to be strict, it's got to be stop, and it doesn't work. I mean, when you're out running at maximum speed, do you stop? No, it's boom, 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 boom. Of course. Yeah. Elastic. Um, so, and, you know, it was... It was quite evident that he he had no capacity in the eccentric phase. Mm-hmm. So, with that said, we then started working slow eccentrics, which mean the first, I think, probably four weeks, um, we did slow eccentrics. So we're doing three seconds, two and a half seconds down, just mm-hmm. to control the weight and just building a some capacity and then as soon as we got through a phase of, of four to six weeks we would then in the next phase we would add velocity so for example in that first two week block we would do slow eccentrics let's say at 150 160 kilos in the second block we would do quarter squats but at a higher velocity because mm-hmm. it's a short range of motion and a higher velocity also in the eccentric or just the concentric? In, in both, especially in the eccentric. Mm-hmm. And so what you find then is that you, you've got to find that range of motion, that sweet spot. And what we found is when we've worked with, with athletes from different sports and different events in track and field is that, um, and when we do testing, we usually use a Smith machine, um, which a lot of people get you know, oh, you, you can't use a Smith machine. Okay, fine. Uh, we think it's great because it's very safe. You don't have to worry about balance. Uh, and when we test, we can just concentrate on one thing, and that is going after the eccentric phase and going after the concentric phase. And that's what we want to do because we want to see the capacity of the of the system. We don't want to see what you can balance and you know and and so yeah. forth. We all of those variables out. All we want to see is how much horsepower can this motor? That's, yeah. that's why when you when you take your car to a to a dyno tune, they strap it down so the damn thing doesn't move, and then they spin the back wheels as fast as the motor can can do it. So we do the same thing. So we use a Smith machine for that purpose. Um, and what you find then is that you you'll find that if these guys go down a centimeter, two centimeters below a certain point, it's game over. They won't get back up again. Mm-hmm. So once you find that sweet spot and you find out, okay, it might be at a certain degree, is that, for example, in sprinting, it you only have to look at where is the, the stance phase in sprinting. I mean, it's nearly you nearly have a straight leg. I mean, there's not yep. much need at all. So we, we can then very quickly say that the, the actual position that you're in in sprinting has got nothing to do with, for example, a deep squat. Yeah. So... You build, you build some capacity, but you build that capacity as a buffer to be able to handle things up here at much higher speeds and higher loads because that's where I'm going to be working. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a little bit like we, we use, I use these, when I hold lectures and things, I talk to people, I say, it's like building a house. If you, if you want a you know, house, um, of one story, you can use a, a fairly thin uh, concrete pad. But if you're going to build a high rise, you need some serious concrete underneath because you've got so much happening up top. Yeah. So that that's the same thing there. That's why if you look at Sue, you've got to have that capacity that he, what he can do with 200 kilos. It's not like we're trying to get him to stronger. Yeah. What we're doing is we're building a capacity to move his body weight, but we know that to be able to do what we were asking him to do, you've got to be able to move about two and a half to 2.7 times your body weight fast. If yeah. you can't do that, you won't run fast. That's, yeah. that's bottom line. Yeah. So, um, um so it almost sounds like uh, the at, at this point the um like the the strength training and the stimulus that strength training gives is 
like the byproduct is uh, getting him stronger where you're just looking for the stimulus to uh, transfer to the to the uh, sprinting and running um, for example most of my athletes see if you ask me people ask me many times at conference how strong are your athletes well what do you mean what's their one rm i have no idea i have no idea it's totally interesting because it's what we for example My colleague, uh, Kenneth, um, in Sweden, we, he's the guy that I've worked with for the whole time I've lived in Sweden. He was a decathlete like I was, and he's, he was the, the, the coach of the Swedish record holder who was a uh, silver medalist at the World Championship, did 8,500 points in the decathlon. Um, and we've come up with a few new metrics, like the EA index, for example, and, and a few other things. And what we also look at, we look at, at, at frequency. In other words, how many lifts per second? Uh, how much, how many kilos per second can you lift? But mm -hmm. these, I mean, nobody else is, is even talking. Everybody's talking about power. Okay, well, you uh, produce power over one or two or three repetitions. But how many kilos per second? Because your ability to accelerate, for example, in 100 meters is all about how many kilos you can move at a certain frequency because these yeah. guys think at about 4.5 to 5 steps a second a second yeah so all of a sudden now you've got to take a whole bunch of steps very very quickly where you've got to be moving some big weights or the equivalent very very fast otherwise you're just not going to get down the track fast enough that's that's the bottom line yeah so you have to You have to build that capacity. So, um, and also, what we also do and is that to keep the, to keep this elasticity in. For example, if we're doing if we're doing cleans from the floor, then we'll go straight over and we'll do some some ankle pop ups, mm -hmm. uh, six hurdles between each set. Then then that's the, that's that's the set. Then we have a break, and then we might do three sets. If we do cleans, we'll do ankle pop ups. Um, if we do um, We could be doing we could be doing some heavy box squats, and we'll do some standing start. Um, for example, um, um, what do we call them? Speed bounds. Mm -hmm. Maybe eight, ten, twelve steps. Mm -hmm. It's all all always to tie in the elasticity components. We don't just lift heavy and walk away. We mm -hmm. always we always transfer it to an elastic component mm -hmm. um would you like um change because you you talked to, you, or you hinted at this when you talked about the uh, ea index um one time uh, that you would like you have a different kind of view on the ea index for uh, like field sport athletes in comparison to track and field athletes because they obviously have longer ground contact times and so uh could you give a little insight on this yeah actually i i, I put together i i asked kenneth to send me so i'll see if i can get it up here uh, no. here we go now this Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So this is the EA index. It says peak velocity divided by, by time to peak velocity. And now these two curves are from two very different athletes. One, the one up top, has got a very high mm -hmm. um, EA index. The one below, the black line, is very low. What's the difference mm -hmm. between these? Well, the guy up top, he's training... To, you know, in, in accordance to what we believe is the way to train. And mm -hmm. the, guy, the guy below is also in the same event, in the same sport, but he's training conventional. Mm -hmm. So he's in the gym, he's chasing kilos, he's chasing one rep max, and, you know, and he's doing velocity-based training at 0.7 meters per second and 1.2 meters per second. Why? I don't know. Mean that, velocity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and this, and then when we test them, this is what we get. So, which which one of these two athletes is going to excel in a, in a in a fast dynamic sport? Well, it's quite evident. The guy with the red line. Yeah. So, this is these. It's it's these types of things that that we um, 
that we look at um, and try to figure out. And we're, again, we're, we're just trying to dumb it down. A few of the things that we've been looking at, I mean, we've got the spreadsheet that we use um, is, is quite extensive. If we look at Muscle Lab, but this is what's so good about Muscle Lab. It's when you've done a test, for example, you just export it to Excel and all you do is just press a button and the whole, the whole session just goes boom into, into Excel. And then all we've done is in our spreadsheet, we've just added all these metrics at the top. So it sorts everything out according to what we want. So we've got, I don't know, 25, 30 different met metrics. And we're still just trying to figure out, you know, some of them because sometimes you get cases where athletes are doing things and then we, you test them and, you've, you've, you know, you've got sort of a notion that this is how it works. And then all of a sudden you get an athlete and he doesn't tick the boxes like mm -hmm. he else does. So you, you figure. So then, all of a sudden, here you've got you know an anomaly um, where somebody's obviously able to do things very, very well, but he doesn't do it the same way everybody else does. So, so then the question it becomes, and this is what we want to we, we want to learn more and more about the training process and and how that and how these factors all in, are you know integrated and, and how they. Uh, how they um, influence each other. And then all of a sudden you'll get athletes that they break the mould. They just absolutely just, you know, you just sit there and you go, okay, how is this even possible? And then you've got to try to figure out, okay, and then you go in and you look at the spreadsheet and you'll see things sticking away over here and he's good at that, he's good at that, and he's very bad at that. But how the hell does he generate this? Mm -hmm. Then you so you, you you're trying to learn how these different things influence each other and so forth, and, and that is a, a lot of the, the sort of the detective work that we've been doing is just trying to understand as much as we can about the training process, and that's why, for example, Randy and I, and Raina um, and Kenneth, we we use technology uh, because if you don't use technology, I'm sorry, you can you know I mean we've been in the field for you know together with our years of experience, we're, we're all like, well, Rain is the, the youngest of us and he's 52 or 51. Mm. The rest of us, we're all over 60 and Kenneth is over 70. So if you add up the years that we've been, you know, banging our head against the wall trying to figure this out, you know, you're looking over a century, well over a century of experience at, at high performance. So it, it sort of... Yeah, you know, it, it it gets it gets to the stage where you think, okay, well, we've got, you know, we know what we're doing, and then then you get athletes all of a sudden that break the mold, and you then you realise, no, we don't, we don't know everything, <laughs> um, and that's and this is what's so fun. I mean, it, it at at first it can be frustrating because you know you've got a model and somebody comes in and just absolutely kicks the crap out of your model, mm -hmm. but that's the good part because then all of a sudden things just go bing, 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 because we we start to understand more. But then then the, the thing is, how do you use that? That's the next thing. And this is where it gets real, real tricky because you just can't sort of throw things in, into the pot and just add another ingredient. Now, my wife is a very, very good cook, and I'm an absolutely useless cook. Um, why? Because she understands what she needs to put in to make, you know, whatever she's making tastes great and look great, you know, and I don't know what the ingredients are doing because I have no understanding of, you know, all these different things. So that's, that's virtually what we're doing. We're just trying to understand all the ingredients that we're able to put into this pot and how they influence each other. And I think that's what, that's what uh, is the problem. When you when you come, I, I, when I started, I once said that we you've got two schools. You've got the academic school, mm -hmm. and they they do this to some extent, but they're only doing it at a level where you're only looking at a certain model of athletes, your college athlete. They, they're not able to do it on world class athletes for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if there's some some researchers that I've never heard, don't know, you know, from Yahoo. I'm not going to get one of my best athletes to, to try something. I'm, no way. You know, yeah. I'm going to try something. It'll be me and not him. Um, 
And then you have the next model, and this is what's happening in, 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 in administrations, and we were discussing last night. So the next model of coaches that you're getting into the getting into the system today are former athletes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got athletes that some of them have won Olympic gold medals, and they're getting these big jobs in, in organizations. Now, the problem is, what happens with these guys? Most of these guys, they haven't coached anybody, but they have an experience as an athlete, and, and of course they have knowledge, but they've never coached anybody. So when they come into a system, they don't want to go down and learn the trade by working with juniors. They jump into where they finish their careers at high performance. Yeah. So what happens is they virtually just mirror what they were doing. So whatever yeah. injuries and whatever problems they had, they will take with them to the next generation. So yeah. it's very interesting if you start looking at certain coaches um, that they have the same type of injuries and the same sort of – you can see that, you know, there are things there which, you know, um, are very similar to their own career. Now, if you look at me, I was a decathlete. I was chronically injured because I had people around me who didn't understand the decathlon, um, and I just jumped – you know, I, I always thought – um, that more was better. Uh, and, of course, and Kenneth did the same thing, and we scored just under 8,000. But th that's crap. Um, and what we did was we killed speed, we killed elasticity, we were mm -hmm. big, strong, but we weren't fast. Mm -hmm. And I had, I don't know, I had nine operations. Now, in all my years of coaching, I've never had a hamstring injury, I've never had a muscle tear, I've had a few inflammations, yes, that you can't get away from that. Not one of my athletes has ever torn a muscle. No, mate, no injuries. Why? Because I've understood that you, more is not better and that you've got to have recoveries and you, you can only work, and that's why I work with two weeks because I've seen that some, some coaches work three weeks and if you're going to work three weeks – there's one thing that you've got to have. You've got to have a medical staff, um, mm. recovery staff, 100% in tune with your athlete and that event full-time. Then you mm -hmm. can work three-week blocks. Randy works three-week blocks, for example, with Sue because he has that backup. Yeah. Now, Jacob, for example, in Australia, he has no backup, virtually nothing. So... Can we work three-week blocks? No. Can we work nine sessions a week? No. We've we've found a, a a level where we can get him running faster and faster and faster and faster, but recover because yeah. that's the game. If we can't recover and stay healthy, it doesn't matter what we're doing. Das war der erste Teil mit Rolf Ohmann. Im zweiten Teil gibt es noch mehr geballte Informationen für euch. Ich hoffe, es hat euch sehr gefallen. Falls ihr einen Vorschlag für einen Gast habt, lasst mich wissen. Ähm, natürlich sub subscriben, teilen, liken, alles, was man so braucht. Das hilft mir sehr und äh, ich freue mich drüber. Ich hoffe, wir sehen uns beim nächsten Mal. In diesem Sinne, trainiert fleißig, bleibt stark, bleibt schnell und äh, adios. <lacht>